The latest Starship engine, the Raptor 3, is nearing its first flight debut, and it's a beast. Significantly more powerful, yet lighter and more compact, it's almost the perfect engine. Almost. Elon Musk has said there's still room for improvement, and the next iteration, the Raptor 4, is already in the planning stages. So, what can this engine really do, and why are they chasing an even better version? The Raptor engine is the heart of the Starship program. It is SpaceX's advanced, full-flow, staged combustion rocket engine, running on liquid methane and liquid oxygen, and it powers both stages of the system, 33 sea-level Raptors on the Super Heavy booster, and a mix of sea-level and vacuum-optimized Raptors on the Starship upper stage. As of late 2025, Raptor 2 is the workhorse engine flying on current Starship vehicles. Raptor 3 is the latest evolution, focused on major simplification and refinement. It reduces external plumbing through integrated cooling channels, improves reliability, and delivers better overall performance. These engines are already being mass-produced and pushed through extensive testing, with hundreds of test firings completed. But the real leap forward isn't just Raptor 3. It's the version that comes after it, Raptor 4. Rather than a radical redesign, the goal is to push everything that already works to the next level. Higher performance, greater durability, and even more efficient production. So first, let's tackle the question everyone is wondering. Just how powerful is this engine going to be? When Raptor reaches 300 tons of thrust at liftoff, which Raptor 3.X can probably do, certainly Raptor 4 will, then it will have 10,000 metric tons of thrust at liftoff, which is 22.5 million pound force, almost exactly three times Saturn V. Elon Musk has said he's confident that Raptor 4 will reach at least about 300 tons of thrust, 3,000 kilonewtons, at sea level. If that happens, a super heavy booster with 33 engines could produce roughly 10,000 tons of total liftoff thrust, making it the most powerful rocket stage ever built. A rocket with three times the thrust of Saturn V is going to rattle some teeth and foundations in Cape Canaveral. He's also mentioned that Raptor 3, and especially the vacuum version of Raptor 4, could reach a specific impulse of around 380 seconds. Specific impulse, or ISP, is basically a way to measure how efficiently a rocket engine uses its fuel. Higher ISP means the engine gets more push out of the same amount of propellant. So, how do engineers actually increase specific impulse? One reason Raptor can reach such high efficiency is its larger nozzle, which lets exhaust gases expand more fully in space. The most effective way is to raise the combustion chamber pressure and optimize how much the exhaust expands as it leaves the engine. You can also improve efficiency by increasing thrust alone or by using a mix of both approaches. But one thing is always true, higher chamber pressure is better. That's exactly what Raptor development has focused on from the beginning and what SpaceX will keep pushing forward. There are known engineering methods that allow engines to handle higher pressures, though not all of them are easy or cheap to use. Testing them takes time and money, but SpaceX's propulsion team has both. Even small pressure increases help a lot. For example, increasing chamber pressure from 300 bar to 1000 bar could mean about 20 extra seconds of ISP, or roughly three times the thrust, which is a huge gain. Some people wonder whether future Raptors might use rotating detonation engines, which are a newer and more experimental idea. So far, these engines haven't shown great efficiency. One major reason is that they don't operate at high average pressure. To get high performance from this kind of engine, you'd need much higher peak pressures, but no one has yet shown a realistic injector design that can handle that. Current designs rely on pressure losses that work at low pressures but completely fall apart at high pressures. Because of this, rotating detonation engines don't look very promising for rockets right now. The most likely path forward for Raptor isn't a totally new engine cycle, but major internal improvements. That means better turbo pumps, a stronger and more advanced combustion chamber, and continued increases in chamber pressure. From the outside, Raptor 4 may not look dramatically different from earlier versions, but inside, it could represent a huge step forward in performance. Another big question is, why does SpaceX need the huge power of Raptor 4? One possible answer is Starship Block 4. Elon Musk shared a slide that outlines SpaceX's Starship roadmap. 
It shows versions 1 and 2, with version 3 expected to fly for the first time by the end of this year. Next to version 3 is a much larger design, Starship version 4. According to that slide, version 4 would use an 81-meter-tall booster and a 61-meter-tall upper stage. That matches Elon's earlier comments that a future version could be about 20% more efficient than the current version 3 design, bringing the total height to around 142 meters. However, Elon also pointed out that this slide is only meant to show the general direction SpaceX is heading. The numbers aren't final. More recently, he's talked about a starship that could be closer to 150 meters tall with a total mass of about 7,500 tons. With a vehicle this large, SpaceX is aiming to put more than 200 tons into orbit while still keeping the system fully reusable. To make that possible, Starship version 4 would use 42 engines in total. That includes three additional Raptors on a much longer upper stage, and those extra engines would be vacuum-optimized Raptors designed to work best in space. The interesting part is that even Raptor 3 should already be powerful enough to fly this version 4 design. So once again, the question comes up, why Raptor 4? The most likely answer is that Raptor 4 isn't just for version 4, it's for what comes next. A more powerful engine could allow SpaceX to move to a larger Starship diameter, something Elon has mentioned before. That could mean a vehicle 12 to 18 meters wide. SpaceX might start with 12 meters, since smaller increases in size are easier to build quickly and produce at high rates. Of course, building rockets at these sizes, and at the launch cadence SpaceX wants, would require massive investments in infrastructure. But with Raptor 4, SpaceX would have the engine power needed to make that next leap possible. Having a huge, powerful rocket with extremely powerful engines is great. You can send massive payloads to Mars in a single launch. But from a commercial space company's point of view, none of that matters if it doesn't make economic sense. That's why Raptor 4 doesn't just need to be powerful, it also needs to be cheap to build. Elon Musk has tweeted, Raptor 3 will probably be two to four times better than Merlin in dollars per ton of thrust and will exceed Merlin in thrust to weight ratio. Raptor 4 should beat Merlin by more than 10 times in dollars per ton of thrust with further improvements in thrust to weight ratio and efficiency. The key idea here is that rocket engines aren't naturally expensive. They've historically been expensive because they were built in very small numbers and designed extremely conservatively. The metric dollars per ton of thrust simply compares how much thrust you get for the money you spend. When you look at engines this way, older engines like the RS-25 seem incredibly expensive, not because they're magically better, but because they were hand-built, produced in tiny quantities, and never optimized for cost. Merlin was the first major engine to break away from that old mindset. Raptor pushes that idea much further. One reason Raptor looks so good on a cost-per-thrust basis is that each engine produces far more thrust than Merlin. If Raptor makes about 2.5 times the thrust, then even if it costs the same per engine, it would already be much cheaper per ton of thrust. If it costs less per unit, as SpaceX is clearly aiming for, the improvement becomes dramatic very quickly. That's where claims like 10 times better than Merlin come from. No new physics is required, just higher thrust and lower manufacturing cost. So what actually sets the minimum cost of a rocket engine? At the most basic level, it's materials, precision machining, and testing. Engines need high temperature alloys, accurate turbo pumps, sensors, valves, and a combustion chamber that won't destroy itself. None of that is free, but none of it is inherently ultra expensive either. The huge gap between raw material cost and historical engine prices mostly comes from low production rates, manual assembly, heavy paperwork, and extremely strict manufacturing rules. SpaceX is deliberately trying to remove all of that. Reusability helps, but it's not the whole story. Reuse only works economically if the engine is cheap enough that losing one doesn't break the business case. SpaceX's strategy is to drive manufacturing costs down first, then let reuse multiply the savings. That's why they're willing to build large numbers of engines even though they plan to reuse them many times. Cheap engines make aggressive reuse safe, not risky. This is where economies of scale matter most. Car factories are a good comparison. If you only build a few dozen engines, each one is basically a prototype. Once you build thousands, you can justify automation, custom tooling, simpler designs, and teams whose sole job is cutting costs. Merlin crossed that line. Raptor is meant to go far beyond it. 
If Starship ever reaches the flight rates Musk talks about, Raptor production will start to resemble jet engine manufacturing, not traditional rocket engine production. At that point, normal aerospace pricing simply stops making sense. Nothing in physics prevents a $200,000 to $250,000 Raptor engine. The real risks are practical ones production yield, testing bottlenecks, or manufacturing methods turning out more expensive than expected. But those are execution challenges, not hard limits. That's the core philosophical shift. Rockets don't have to be rare, slow, or expensive. Raptor 3 is meant to prove that the idea works technically. Raptor 4 is meant to prove it works economically. If they succeed even halfway, the impact on launch costs and the broader space industry will be permanent. A perfect example of why SpaceX became one of the most cost-effective and reliable launch providers comes from a 2017 interview with Tom Mueller. If you don't know him, he's basically a genius. A SpaceX co-founder, the company's first employee, and the mastermind behind the Merlin engines that power the Falcon rockets. In the interview, Mueller shared a story from when he was developing the Merlin 1D. Elon asked him, how much do you think it costs to make a Tesla Model S? Mueller guessed, I don't know, maybe $50,000? Elon said, no, about $30,000. That's the marginal cost for the car. Then Elon asked, and how much does that car weigh? About 5,000 pounds, Mueller replied. And how much does a Merlin engine weigh? About 1,000 pounds. So why the heck does it cost a fraction of a million dollars to make a Merlin engine? Mueller admitted Elon had a point. Sure, the materials aren't aluminum, but even if you factor in five times the cost, it's still basically a 5,000-pound engine. So why 20 times the cost? That's the exact mindset at SpaceX. Focus on reducing the real cost of the rocket. Once you start reusing it, the big expenses are amortization, operations, and fuel. Basically the same model as airliners. Look at a commercial jet, about half its cost is operational, and the rest is spreading out the $300 million price tag over its lifetime. That's the kind of thinking SpaceX uses to make space travel affordable. Mueller also talked about their approach to suppliers. We avoid traditional space vendors like the plague. When developing Merlin, I needed valves for liquid oxygen and kerosene. I went to the usual suppliers and asked, can you give me a good price on your existing product? They couldn't. So I asked, can you design a much lower cost one? That's how we pushed for efficiency. If it takes two weeks just to get a quote, that's already the wrong vendor. How long would it take them to build the part?